Welcome to Art Break Live. I'm Susie Wolf, and I work in the Education Department at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And today we are going to look at an art form that requires balance and flexibility and skill and bravery. And that art form is called acrobatics. Now we have a lot of works in the collection that feature acrobats or circus themes, um, but we're going to concentrate on three of those works of art today. And as always, if you have questions or comments, go ahead and type them below and we'll take a look at them when we get to the live portion of our program. So it may be that many of you like to do handstands and cartwheels or somersaults. And acrobatics is an art form that goes back thousands of years. And here's our first artwork. It is two acrobats balancing on the rim of a Chinese uh, wine warmer that uh, was made about 2000 years ago. And so if you do handstands, I'm pretty sure that you would rather do them in soft grass or a nice smooth floor than the rim of this vessel. These girls show their strength by pushing up on the rim into a handstand look back at each other and then hit their feet at precisely the right time so that they hit their feet in the center of the pot. Now during the winter months in China about 2000 years ago when there was less farm work to do families might practice stunts together and then perform them in the spring um, at various festivals and the best acrobats would form troops that would travel around um, and perform and the very best of the acrobats would perform for the emperor and this is a scroll from 1485 that features the Ming dynasty emperor Xian Zhang and in front of him are a number of acrobats performing and if you look carefully at these acrobats you'll see some leaping through hoops, balancing on a pole, being spun on a wheel, and being thrown into the air by another acrobat. Now, a precious scroll such as this would be rolled and then open from time to time to be admired. And its purpose was very different from the earthenware vessel that belongs to the BMA on which uh, the two girls perform handstands. And that was never meant to be seen by an individual uh, during their lifetime. It was actually a funeral vessel, which means that it was put into a tomb uh, with the deceased and it would be placed there along with clay jugglers uh, and dancers and musicians to entertain the spirit of the person in the afterlife. Now in Europe and the United States, um, acrobatics have been popular for centuries, but there was one feat in particular that was made the uh, art form explosive. And that was in 1859, a French acrobat named Charles Blondin crossed the Ni Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He made the quarter mile journey over 300 times and each time he crossed he made the journey uh, more and more exciting. So he crossed blindfolded, he crossed pushing a wheelbarrow or a person on his back. At one point he even crossed and stopped and made an omelette and ate it on the high wire. And then the scariest one of all probably was when he was balancing on one leg of a chair and something happened and the chair fell into Niagara Falls and he was trying to catch his balance and was finally able to using his balancing pole. Now after that in Europe, um, troops that performed on trampolines and high wire and um, trapeze and those who balanced on barrels and balls increased in popularity. Now here's a photo of Italian acrobat Enrico Rastelli, who still today is considered the best juggler who ever lived. In 1917, French artist Albert Glaze painted this painting called On a Circus Theme. And there's so much going on here that it deserves a close look. Now Glaze painted this um, abstractly which means that he did not try to capture real life. 
So there are a lot of colors and a lot of shapes and they can be interpreted in many ways. And I'd love for, uh, as you look at this painting, if you um, see some things um, that you think you recognize, type them below and we'll take a look when we get to the live portion of the program. So as I looked at the painting, I saw some dots uh, at the bottom of uh, the painting and, and the upper right. And they reminded me of the heads of audience members at the circus. And I felt as though I was looking at the top of their heads. And if that's the case, then I'm in the position of an acrobat flying through the air. And with so much color and sh so many shapes to look at, the eye really doesn't know um, where to begin. And in that way, it reminds me of a three ring circus. Well, the last object that we're going to take a look at is by Swiss artist Paul Clay. It's a painting from 1937 called Traveling Circus. And instead of capturing the dynamism inside the big top, he has captured a quiet moment uh, of the performers. And we see uh, an acrobat in a pink uh, skirt stretching and a clown who has one eye and is wearing a sombrero, and then a donkey. Now, uh, Clay used what's called a stippling technique, and that means he uh, used tiny dots of color um, in, in dark pigments to um, create what looks like a night scene. And then he used some yellow uh, pigment up above to make what looks like a starry sky. So behind these figures, we see a tent with some flags flying. And those flags indicated that the, um, the circus was ready to be seen. Now, it's hard to tell if these, uh, if these performers are leaving after a long night or if they're getting ready to enter the big top. And because this girl in the pink, uh, in the pink tutu is stretching, I'm guessing they're ready to go into the tent to perform their techniques. And they uh, and the girls um, on the vessel doing handstands um, and the acrobats that I'm sure are in the Glaze painting, I know will capture their audience's attention with their acrobatic arts. So stay uh, here for just a second and we will go live in a moment. Hi, this is Veronica Betancourt. As Susie promised, I'm filling in for her while she's away this week. Um, thank you for joining us for our own High Wire Act. Uh, we had some mysterious technical difficulties, but I'm here, you're here, and I look forward to um, seeing what questions and comments you have. Uh, so I thought I would start by going back to the Albert Glaze painting um, with all of its color and shapes and forms um, and patterns and start off by asking um, what you see. You know, there's a lot to look at, um, as Susie mentioned, and uh, she pointed out what looks like audience members, maybe sort of in the upper right hand corner as well as uh, at the lower center. But I think there's a lot more that we can look at um, beyond just this sort of potentially being um, in the perspective of the acrobat, kind of high up in the air uh, within the circus tent. Um, as I look at it, one of the things that I think is interesting is that this is um, a painting that I think has a lot of perspectives to it. Like, yes, you could be up above, an acrobat sort of twisting through the air, looking down. Um, but it also kind of looks like maybe there's an elephant in the middle of the canvas, that sort of uh, gray, sort of uh, soft curved shape that perhaps has a small uh, kind of dark uh, eye in the, kind of in the middle. Um, I also see maybe the suggestion of kind of not necessarily a horse, but like the the like the shape of a horse's head at the very top um, in that magenta color, uh, and maybe there's a rider on top of the horse. Um, 
So one of the things that is uh, really interesting about Glez is that he uh, was, was known as a Cubist painter. Um, so uh, he was really interested in not so much how things looked um, and kind of really like representing them the way that they look to his eye, but looking for kind of like an inner truth um, that could be expressed through art and painting and that painting should just kind of be about paint and be about painting. Um, so I think as we look at this, um, this painting, uh, on a circus theme, we can see that, you know, he's really capturing the, uh, the movement, the excitement, all of the drama, um, of being at the circus. Um, so I'll give it maybe a second more to see if there are any questions or comments or thoughts you had on uh, this Glaze painting and what you saw in it. Um, but if not, um, I would like to kind of go back even further in time, like another <laughs> roughly uh, 1800 years um, to our uh, wine warmer vessel uh, that has the two uh, acrobats balancing along the rim. Um, and so one of the things that I think is really pretty, pretty amazing about this is first that someone would create this vessel. Um, if you think about sort of how it might be, how it might look if you kind of put it on a table, it would be pretty impressive. Um, but as Susie mentioned, this wasn't really for putting on a table. Um, this is actually something that is called uh, a form of Mingchi. And if my pronunciation is not the best, please correct me in the comments. I'm always learning. Um, so uh, Mingchi uh, is loosely translated as spirit goods or things that um, were made for people to enjoy in the afterlife. Um, and so at around the time that this particular piece was made with the acrobats balancing on the, the rim in this um, pretty dramatic and dynamic uh, kind of shape where they're kind of touching their, their feet together and coordinating with each other, um, this would have been meant to bring entertainment um, and amusement and joy to uh, the person who had it with them in their tomb. Um, so that they could enjoy some of the, the comforts and pleasures of their uh, lived life <laughs> and extend that into the afterlife. Um, and also roughly around, like in the sort of 200 year window before this piece was made, um, Mingxi, these spirit goods, uh, start to expand into all kinds of things that people would have enjoyed um, and wanted to take from their lived life into the afterlife. So there might be things like wells or like little miniature farms, um, miniature animals, uh, or just, you know, these sorts of, um, as well as figures of, you know, people um, with the idea that you would want to, you know, continue enjoying the afterlife as much as you enjoyed your, uh, your life while you were alive. So um, I'm wondering if there are any kind of uh, thoughts on the acrobats that we've seen. Maybe you want to share some uh, special moments from seeing people perform. Um, maybe you could do some tricks of your own. Uh, I will confess that in the lead up to this episode, I decided to see if I could still turn a cartwheel. Um, so <laughs> I don't have space in this room to do it, uh, but it is something that uh, I was pleased to see that even though I'm no longer eight years old, I can still do. Um, so that was a nice, uh, rediscovery for myself, uh, as I was preparing for joining you on our break live. So I think there's one last thing that I'm interested in sharing with you. Um, and that is looking again at the Paul Clay painting, uh, traveling circus. So I think we're, uh, here we go. There it is. Um, and Susie mentioned stippling. Um, so I thought that I would do a very, very basic uh, attempt at demonstrating stippling um, using some paper and some markers. So if you look at the clay painting, 
Um, and you saw earlier in the episode, you can see that there were really bright little uh, dots of orange paint and blue paint and brown paints and green paints. And if you look at them kind of as a whole, they look like you've got these sorts of olive colors and maybe some aqua and some orange on top of that as we go up into the night sky. Um, but then if we look really closely, there are all kinds of um, different colors put together. So I am dedicating this demonstration to the uh, woman behind the screen, <laughs> Andrea. Uh, she's my colleague and she asked for a little demo of how to do some stippling. So I'm gonna try to get in frame and this is a great example of how hard spatial reasoning is. There we go, thank you. Uh, when you're doing things in reverse. So um, up at the top, you can kind of see how I created this blue background and then there are some kind of bigger marks of orange and bigger marks of blue. And then also these little, little dots um, from Blue Marker. So I thought that if you wanted to try your own hand at stippling, um, you could start out with really any kind of color or just a blank piece of paper um, and have a background. And then stippling is really sort of about making, making quick marks in a way. Um, so, so it's like these, these little, little dots or I'm making some dashes because that makes it easier for you to see it on screen. Um, but the way that Paul Clay would have been doing it, he would have used something like a paintbrush, not a marker, and then sort of maybe dotted it. And you can see as I dot and dot and dot and dot, it kind of build up color. So another thing that Paul Clay did is that he took many colors and put them together. So if I take some dark green, I can kind of build it up and I don't know, maybe, maybe you can make like a bush. I wasn't planning on making a bush, but it sort of seems to be turning out that way. What do you think? I don't know, let's try. Let's try some orange because it has been pretty warm in Baltimore lately. And thankfully we got some rain to cool off, but it has, when it feels super hot, to me, it feels like the temperature is orange. So this is, I don't know. Maybe this is the reputation of how I felt that the sun has been uh, lately in terms of being so, so hot. And then we can end our little stippling demonstration. So there we go. Final product, uh, not my greatest work. But, you know, we've got Paul Clay on screen, so you can enjoy something that is far more uh, crafted than my tiny demonstration. So um, I've really enjoyed uh, spending some of the afternoon with you and getting to talk about all things acrobatic. Um, I'm just going to check and see if there are any uh, final thoughts or questions and give you a few seconds to maybe uh, think about acrobats and um, just sort of really dynamic art. Okay, well, um, if you do have any thoughts, feel free to comment afterward and uh, we can maybe address them later. So I want to thank you for joining us today. I also say that if you had fun with this episode and are looking for uh, some art making that you can do this weekend, um, please check out our Free Family Sunday activity, uh, which gets sent out, I believe, every Friday, um, so that you have something to uh, enjoy for art making over the weekend. And this week, uh, I believe that we are looking at making collages of different kinds of uh, beings, sort of inspired by uh, Wangechi Mutu's Water Woman. So have a look out for that. And thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure.